we list the four P's of creative learning, projects, passion, peers, and play, we tend to list projects first, because in some ways, projects form the foundation of the creative process. And when I think of a project, I think about people making and creating things. In fact, creating is at the root of creative. So I think we see creating projects as a core activity in the creative learning experience. Um, so it's great to have with us for this conversation, Andrew Slowinski, who's been involved with several websites that were specifically designed to support kids in creating projects. Right now, he's working as the engineering lead with us on the Scratch team here at the Media Lab, but he was also the co-founder of a great kids maker site or DIY site called DIY.org that's really where projects are at the core of the site. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about DIY.org and some of your motivations in, in developing the site. Sure, so DIY.org really is a place where we wanted um, any 12 year old who had like an obsession with you know bugs or programming or um, any subject that they were really passionate about to be able to connect them to projects and to other kids who are passionate about those same things to build creative confidence and sort of grow as a creative learner um, within this community of people who are all kind of exploring their passions, exploring their interests around projects and around building projects. It may give us some examples of some of the types of projects that... Sure, so um, kids build, build everything from giant cardboard theater sets that they do stop motion animation with to building farms and little gardening plots, to doing rocketry, to uh, collecting bugs, to programming, you know, you kind of name it. We have about 120 different skills that cover a really broad range of topics and areas and interests for the kids on the site. In terms of motivations, I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the earliest experiences that I had that really made me reflect on sort of project-based learning as a potential approach was in 2001, I originally I moved to Detroit and I had the opportunity to go to, um, to a local elementary school that was prepping for Michigan standardized testing. And they asked me if I would come and help them help tutor the kids in math before the, before the standardized test. And I came in and I saw this entire classroom of kids that were incredibly disinterested, inc felt incredibly pressured by this, this sort of impending test. Um, and it sort of made me reflect on um, there's got to be a way in which we can contextualize mathematics, that we can contextualize this subject matter in a way that could be comp more compelling than you know doing worksheets and solving word problems. Um, and so that was kind of this moment. This was that was this moment for me when I when I reflected on my own learning and how I best learn, which is definitely through projects and not through solving word problems. Mm. <laughs> um, and started to kind of build uh, a curriculum and build a, a process with these students at this local elementary school that was around projects and around learning the math that they needed to, to, to solve problems that were relevant to them, to solve problems that were important to them. You then started some maker spaces in Detroit to yeah. give kids a place to work on those projects. Exactly. And it, just kind of snowballed over time. <laughs> you know, before I knew it, I found myself going to Harbor Freight and buying cheap screwdrivers. Um, and over time, what we found was that when we could build these kind of spaces where a kid felt safe, a kid felt sort of secure to explore um, the things that were interesting th to them, the things that were personally relevant to them to solve problems that felt important to them, all of a sudden learning could kind of take shape in a way that we weren't seeing that happen in the classroom. And so um, that just kind of kept going over time, building hacker spaces, working with kids more, until I met up with a group of other like-minded folks uh, and DIY.org took, took shape from that. Yeah. So it's basically from the individual neighborhood makerspace trying to make a worldwide makerspace of letting people <laughs> share their maker creations with others. Yeah, which in some ways was kind of a crazy naive thing, <laughs> right? Like thinking of, well, it works for these 30 kids. Right. Why not, you know, 300,000 yeah. or however many? So, um, uh, yeah, that translation process was, was definitely really interesting. And there was a lot of work that went into understanding how to do that at scale, how to do that outside of a, a, of a sort of more controlled physical environment. But I think a lot of the things stayed uh, in terms of the values of building a safe space, building a place where kids could iterate, building a place where kids could synthesize 
lots of interest in many different skills and, many, and use projects as a way to kind of piggyback and go between various different subjects to build, uh, to build knowledge, to build community, to build the things that they care yeah, about. This contrast between projects and problems. Right. Uh, and again, I, I always put projects at the center, but it doesn't mean I, I, that I'm against problem solving. Problem <laughs> solving is a good thing. It's go on the record and say I believe in problem solving. But I do think I sort of feel that problem solving becomes relevant when it's in the context of a project. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, that's one of the things that's always really interesting with kids is sometimes you'll find kids who have a really strong association with, I wanna solve a problem, and then you'll have other kids who you know, wanna tell a story or mm -hmm. want to do things in different ways. And so one of the things that I've always found important to building these kinds of spaces or building this kind of experiences for kids is finding ways to sort of uh, be inclusive of all of those different ways of thinking about projects. Like a project could be a story, it could be uh, solving a problem that a kid really wants to solve, um, or it could even be um, something that's more peer-oriented, building something for someone else. Um, Maybe there's an example from DIY.org about how someone's work evolved over time and the types of projects they worked on. Sure, I mean, I think um, one, one contemporary example has been this uh, maker on the site named Emma Shu. And Emma um, Emma's actually a newer maker in the DIY community, but she really started out building um, um, simple objects out of cardboard. She just kind of gravitated to that as a medium. And one of her first projects was just a simple cardboard camera. And you can kind of see in the project, she's doing some interesting things. She's like peeling apart the cardboard to, to create some different textures. But the craft isn't, you know, it's not, it's not stellar yet. But she's really, she's starting to show some real creativity around building sets or building objects um, or creating characters. And over time, you start to see her kind of go into different areas. So she takes some time away from cardboard and she goes and explores sewing. And then she'll take some time away from that and she goes and explores uh, stop motion animation. And then she takes some time away from that and she explores uh, video production. Um, and she kind of goes through all of these different skills. And then all of a sudden, uh, there's a couple moments uh, that started to happen pretty recently where you see all of these different skills, all of these different projects sort of synthesize and culminate and kind of come together to build something completely new. And she started to build these uh, sort of cardboard, Jim Henson-esque worlds <laughs> that are amazing. They're, they're just truly amazing creations. Um, but that's from this synthesis of knowledge where I think one of the things that I really appreciate about project-based learning is that this synthesis or this association between skills creates really cohesive sets of knowledge, whereas disassociated learning can, also, can often create sort of islands of knowledge. Yeah, and too often a lot of schools today are organized that way. You learn sets of concepts, you don't know how to connect them right. or to then you know, link them together. Uh, I think that, but there's some challenges with the project-based approach. I know one thing is you're not, it, oftentimes the school things are set up, do you know exactly what the kids are gonna learn? It's a lesson that's designed to help them learn a particular concept. Usually with projects, it has a somewhat different feel to it. <laughs> You almost always. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think it's, it's interesting in that I think a lot of times the, the motivations and interests and passions of the kid can often lead to sort of unexpected outcomes in a project. So a kid might um, be exploring a very specific subject area like, um, like sewing or coding um, and come out of the process instead of learning something about uh, control structures and operators uh, as like high level programming concepts, they might learn something about friendship or learn something about um, creating characters or something much more on the creative side of the spectrum. And that sort of uh, non-deterministic relationship between a project and the, knowledge and the learning outcomes that happen, uh, I think is a wonderful thing, but can, can cause problems in certain contexts. Yeah. Yeah, for me, maybe the most important thing that kids learn as they work on projects is about the whole process of making projects. Because I think in our lives, we spend a lot of our time making projects. When people grow up, if you're a journalist, writing an article is a project. Right. If you're a marketing manager, putting together a marketing campaign is a project. If you're an auto mechanic, fixing a car is a project. So, and there's a certain type of process that goes through of exploring the possibilities. 
trying something out, modifying based on what happens, asking others for advice. That are true to all types of projects. So I think for me, that's one of the most important things that gets learned. And usually through different projects, you learn different pieces of the process and it comes together over time. Yep. I think right now, as you've shifted over and started working with us on the Scratch team, uh, there's new types of projects that are supported in the Scratch community where uh, in maker spaces, it's oftentimes focused on physical making. In the Scratch community, it's focused more on virtual making of making interactive stories and games. Uh, what do you see as some of the ways in which you know, this all fits together as of seeing the coding that goes on the Scratch website as a new type of making and project? So I think um, one thing that I find interesting about the Scratch community and the DIY community is that they're so unbelievably similar in that both communities have this deep intent around allowing kids to be creative or to create. Um, it's really around a productive philosophy or a productive sort of perspective on kids' capabilities in the world. And, and so in that way, you know, the fact that DIY, a lot of DIY happens, you know, sort of in outside or away from a computer screen and the fact that a lot of scratch happens in front of a computer screen, I don't actually distinguish that mm -hmm. that big of a difference. The intent is very similar. It's about, it's about having a very productive relationship yeah. to media. Yeah, I agree. I think too often you see a lot of parents and teachers these days will focus on like how much screen time do kids have. And to me, that doesn't make sense. It's not the medium that's most, most important, but what the kids are doing with it. And kids could do creative activities with, with wood or on the computer screen make an animation. Uh, and what's important to me is that they go through that creative process of imagining, creating things, sharing with others, modifying, reflecting upon it. Uh, you can do both creative things in both of those worlds or uncreative things in both those worlds. Right, yeah. So to me, it seems more important how can we support kids doing creative expression regardless of what medium they're using. Yep. Yeah. I think, for me, I often like using the analogy with writing that the same way that uh, we don't expect everyone to grow up to become a professional writer, but we you know that writing is something that everyone can use to express themselves. And I do think the same thing happens with the making that goes on at DIY.org, the programming that goes on at the Scratch site, is kids are learning to express themselves. And regardless of whether they're going to grow up to become professional engineers or computer scientists, but it's just a new way of expressing themselves. Yeah, and I think um, understanding a very broad definition of what it is to be creative, what it is to create, I think leads to kids who not only have more confidence to sort of um, address the problems that happen as they grow up, but also the, the, the sort of exploding complexity of different things that are coming up, right? Um, it's very hard to train kids for a world that doesn't exist yet. Um, and so building a really thoughtful and a really thorough basis around creativity in a broad variety of contexts can help prepare them better for that sort of world. Yeah. Well, it's been great working together with you on these ideas, both in helping to open up these new possibilities for kids. So I look forward to more creating projects together to help kids create projects together. <laughs> so thanks a lot for joining us to talk about projects. Happy to be here. Mm -hmm.